this presentation is to give you an overview of your physical geography fieldwork. Geography fieldwork follows the inquiry process. This starts with coming up with a key question, an inquiry question of what you want to find out. You come up with your hypothesis and then you work through the methods, risk assessments, all the way through to the evaluation. And so in this video, we're going to explain those different stages of the inquiry process that we did. So starting with our inquiry question of what you want to find out, and then the hypothesis is a prediction of what you think you will find out. Our physical field work was to learn more about rivers. So our chosen inquiry question was, how does a river change as it travels from the source to the mouth? This was a suitable question because by investigating this, we would learn more about three aspects of how a river changes. And so the three sub questions that we were going to look at, look at was one, how does the channel width change? Two, how does the velocity of the river change? And thirdly, how does the sediment size change as you move with distance from the source? So at this stage, we've got our inquiry question of how do rivers change? And we've split that into three sub questions, one about how does the width change, one about the velocity and one about the sediment size. So we're now ready to make our hypothesis. We based our hypothesis on the Bradshaw model, which is a model of predicting how we'd expect a river to behave. So for example, about the channel width, we predicted that the size of the channel would get wider because as you move further downstream into the lower course, we know that the geology is softer. And so we thought that would mean it would erode more easily and therefore get wider and wider. You can pause this and read about the other predictions that we made. The next step in the inquiry process is to work out what methods you will use to collect your data. The primary methods are when you collect data yourself. Secondary data is where you have used other people's data and collected that. We chose Bradgate Park as our location for doing our field work. Uh, it's got a small river running through it called the River Lynn. It's just three miles from our school and there's a good footpath alongside the river which makes it easy for us to access the river. At Bradgate Park, we collected data from three sample points. The first sample point was right near the source at the top of uh, the tributary and then at two points further downstream. Clearly, we would be far too time consuming for us to take measurements on the river all the way to where it meets the sea. And so beyond what's shown on this map, we use data from the National Rivers Archive as our secondary data to be able to collect information from there. To carry out our methods, we used a range of different equipment. To investigate the width of the river, we used a tape measure. This was a 25 meter tape measure, so it would be suitable because it would comfortably be long enough to measure the width of the river. At each site, we measured the river from the bank all the way across to the opposite bank. It was important to make sure that the tape measure was held tight so that it was measuring accurately. To measure the velocity of the river, we first of all used a tape measure to me measure 10 meters downstream. And then we used a dog biscuit as an object that floats and that's biodegradable. And we used a stopwatch to time how long it would take the dog biscuit to travel the 10 meters. And from that, we could calculate the velocity. To increase reliability, we repeated our measurements at each site three times. Our method for measuring the sediment size was that at each of the three sites, we selected a sample of uh, material from the river of sediment, and then we measured it using a ruler. We measured each piece of material along its longest axis. We clearly couldn't measure every stone in the river, so again, we had to use sampling. So what we did was at each of the three sites where we'd measured the width of the river, across that width, we took a sample every 50 centimetres. This was systematic sampling. It was also random sampling because at each of those 50 centimetres across the width of the river, we reached into the river and collected out a handful of stones without looking. Those were the stones that we then used to measure. To further help us with our work, at each of the sites we took some photos to help us remember what we did. In the field, we had clipboards and we had data recording sheets so we could record the information in a really 
quick and easy way ready to process that data back in the classroom. Back in the classroom, we also collected our secondary data. So as we mentioned earlier, we could find out about the width and velocity of the river further downstream by using information on the National Rivers Archive. When you're planning your methods, you also need to carry out a risk assessment. One of the risks at Bradgate Park is that it's uh, got lots of wild deer. And so to mitigate this, we informed everyone that if there's deer approaching us, that we just need to walk away slowly. The biggest risk was the danger of the fast flowing water in the river that could potentially knock you off your feet, which could lead to injury or the small chance of drowning. And so to mitigate for this, we checked the depth of the river before we entered. We only entered the river once we could see that it was ankle deep or less. Students entering the river needed to be wearing appropriate footwear, not like Mr. Radford. If you want to look at the methods in more detail, you can pause the video and look at this slide. Having collected the data, we have to then present our results. Before we could do that, some of the data had to be processed to work out what we needed. So for example, uh, in measuring the velocity, we'd just written down the times that it had taken the biscuit to travel 10 meters. And so we had to process this data to calculate the velocity. So for example, we knew that the distance was 10 meters, the time was whatever we'd re recorded in seconds, and then we could do a calculation to work out the velocity. Once we'd done that, we had to work out the mean velocity for each of the three sites. This slide shows a summary of the data once it had been processed. However, even now, it's still not that easy to see the patterns. And so we want to find appropriate graphs or charts so we can see the patterns more easily. So in this format here, we can see uh, the velocity graph. We can see that there's quite clearly that the speed of the river, the velocity of the river speeds up as you move downstream. Looking at the sediment size graph, far more easily in graph form, you can see that the size of the sediment does get smaller. Photos also are useful to refer back to. So that's the photo showing site one. Here's site two. And here's site three. Once you've presented the data clearly, the analysis is where you explain the patterns in your data. You also need to pick out any anomalous results. So here's some example analysis. You can pause the slide if you want to read it in detail, just looking at the first bit. We learned from our data that the river channel does increase in width as you move further along the river from the source to the mouth. Our data showed that the width increased by 790 centimetres from site one, right at the source, to site three. And we've learned that this was due to lateral erosion of stones hitting the side of the river causing abrasion. Also, hydraulic action will widen the river as that force of water uh, hits the side of the riverbank. And actually, as we move further downstream, we know that the, the river gets bigger, has more water in it. And this is what gives that river more power to do more erosion, and hence it gets wider. The conclusion is where we go back to our original inquiry question, and we use our analysis and our findings to show what we've learnt. So our three questions were, how does the channel width change? How does the velocity change? And how does the sediment size carried change? And overall, that helps us to answer that question of how does a river change as it travels from source to mouth? Here's an example of a concluding paragraph. We learned that rivers do become wider as you move from the source. The River Lynn increased in width by 790 centimetres between the sites we measured. Also, our secondary data showed the river was nearly 30 metres wide by the time it reached the coast. These findings show that our hypothesis about rivers getting wider is correct. We learned that this is because the river has more erosive power for hydraulic action and abrasion as you move downstream because it's carrying more water. The final step in the inquiry process is to carry out an evaluation. In other words, how much do we trust our conclusions? How, how reliable is the data that we use to make those conclusions? So let's look at a couple of examples of evaluation. 
one of the things we looked at was how does the sediment size change. What helped make our results reliable was that every group measured five stones at least every 50 centimetres across the river channel. And so this meant we took hundreds of measurements. We used these measurements to calculate the mean average stone size at each site. And you see a large number of measurements gives us greater confidence that the totals we came to are accurate. We also sampled at three different sites, sites one, two and three, to allow us to see if sediment sizes had changed as we moved downstream. What made our results less reliable was that our samples weren't very random. This is because we were biased towards sampling sediment that fitted easily into our hands when we reached into the river. A lot of the small particles were far too small to measure with a ruler. And also, we couldn't find any secondary data about sediment sizes further downstream on the river saw. How could we improve our results if we were to do our work again? Well, we could have used calipers to make more accurate measurements. These are designed for measuring smaller bits of sediment. We could have used a small spade to scoop up our sample so that we're not accidentally choosing what fits in our hand. To measure the velocity, what makes our results reliable was that at each site we repeated our measurement three times. Three times gives more confidence and more accuracy than one measurement. We timed over 10 meters, which is a long enough distance to get a proper idea of the velocity that the water is traveling. We used dog biscuits as they floated well and are biodegradable. The problem was it was hard to measure 10 meters downstream because the river bends so much. For example, if the biscuit was traveling around the outside of the bend, it would be traveling further than if it went around the inside. Also, the biscuit kept getting stuck on rocks and bumping into the riverbank, and this made the time much longer, which made it look like the velocity was slower than what it actually was. How could we improve this? Well, we could have used a flow meter to more accurately measure the river velocity. And actually, what we should have done is ignored the anomalous results where the float had got stuck, and not included them in our calculations when we worked out the velocity. Instead, we should have got rid of the anomalous results and repeated those measurements again. So that's the inquiry process. We started with the question and the hypothesis. We carried out our methods to collect our data, taking into account any risks. We presented the data clearly and appropriately. We analyzed the patterns and came to our conclusion, referring back to our question and our hypothesis. Finally, we evaluated our work to see what improvements we could make and how reliable, how much we can trust our results.